Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming here to the session. Um, my name is Josh Elser. Um, with me today, I have uh, Ankit, my uh, teammate over here. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about consens consensus protocols, um, write-head logs, and how we can, uh, uh, we're going to try to work on some things with HBase to make these work. Um, my standard disclaimer that I'm obligated to say is that all these um, Apache project names, Apache Radis, HBase, um, Apache itself are all trademarks of the Apache Software Foundation. They are not my own names or anything of the such. Um, so we have a general problem that we have to sort of lay groundwork for what we're going to talk about. So when we say distri distributed consensus, you know, what do we actually mean by this? What does that mean? So when we say distributed consensus, the problem we're trying to solve is when we have a number of nodes that so computation that is happening across multiple machines, we have no locality, how do we agree upon a value? So how do you know, if you have one node in uh, some data center on the East Coast, you have another on the West Coast, you have one in Europe. How do you make sure that they all see the same state at the same time? Um, more particularly, what happens if connectivity between those nodes isn't always a guaranteed thing? What happens if sometimes you have you know, a flaky network, maybe something um, something from as silly as like uh, a sea creature ate a, uh, a hole in the fiber that was running underneath the Atlantic. Maybe something as uh, you have a mobile like 3G connection on some remote device that just goes in and out in certain times of the day. So we want to have some protocol here that can agree upon some state across all of these nodes despite any failures that might be happening in the system. So. To sort of go further than that, we also want some other characteristics, right? We want low latency, so we don't want to be sitting around all day waiting for this consensus to happen. We want these nodes that are participating in this protocol together to decide on a value quickly. We want them to do it with high throughput, so we want to say, if I have a thousand things that you need to decide on, I want you to be able to do all of them at once. I don't want you to have to do them all serially, or else, again, we'll be sitting there and it will have the appearance of you're not actually making progress. And of course, fault tolerance. We have a couple algorithms that if we were to say, hey, I want to do some distributed consensus, I think I need to solve this problem. Most likely, like anything else, you don't want to re-implement it yourself. There's other things that you can use off the shelf that have been academically proven to be um, pretty safe. Probably the oldest one of these is Paxos. Um, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I think the original paper was like 1980s-ish, was the original Paxos paper. And it was a really goofy thing because it's like written as like some tribes and I forget, it was, it was a very weird analogy. It wasn't actually written in the sense of computing, but it's like, um, I'll have to go back and read it. But um, we'll talk a little bit more about Paxos later. Um, much more recently, we have Raft. Um, we'll talk about this more. Um, everyone who is probably more familiar with Zookeeper. So Zookeeper has its own consensus protocol called ZAB, the Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast. Um, and then there's also uh, ViewStamp Replication, which is, I think, came out of a Google paper. But these are all sort of, different algorithms all dedicated to trying to solve this general problem of distributed consensus. Um, you can really get into variants of these then. There's all sorts of different kinds of Paxos implementations that have uh, make these little tweaks to the algorithm, say, you know, if I hold this constant, I can make these other decisions, um, all for the sake of trying to make certain situations, certain cases that you'd actually see in real life better. Um, and then we get the really long list when you start looking at implementations of like, okay, yeah, this is really what I need. All these sorts of different things. So anything from databases to actual locking services, things that are building higher level abstractions that make it easy for you to integrate. So for example, like HBase using Zookeeper is a very, um, or Cumulo for that matter too, using Zookeeper is a very um, good application. It gives us a high level semantic to say, hey, I need to get a lock and I want, need to make sure I'm the only one doing some operation as a very desirable operation, just um, very obviously something like you only want one active HBase master or Cumulo master at a time. That's a distributed consensus problem. Specifically today, specifically today we're gonna talk about Raft. Um, Raft is actually one of the more recent uh, implementations of a consensus protocol, um, relatively new, uh, 2013 being new compared to 1980s. Um, it was from um, Diego Angaro, who was a PhD student at Stanford, if I recall. I think John Osterhout was his advisor, or at least his um, cohort in this. Um, when they decided, hey, we're going to build a new consensus protocol, what they really were approaching this from was they didn't want to 
or they saw implementing Paxos and the complexity that went into that being a main barrier for people to actually do it correctly and well. So they said the difficulty to understand Paxos was the biggest problem with Paxos itself. So they said, I think we can write something that would give us an equivalent solution, uh, uh, so solve the consensus problem for us without having to have all this complexity and having to go through cycles of, oh crap, we got it wrong, we need to go back and fix some bugs. So RAF pre really came out of this, let's make something that's more simple, let's prove that the simplicity is correct by a TLA plus, which is a formal specification language, and if we build this thing, it will be a lot easier for other people to come along and implement Raft over something like Paxos. And they made a cute little logo. Um, so, fast forward. So we have this new consensus protocol, it's designed called Raft. How do we actually do something with it? So we need some implementation that actually implements Raft, and one of the implementa implementations of this um, is Apache Radis. So Apache Radis is an incubating um, project at the Apache Software Foundation. Um, it's the notable implementation, or the notable characteristic of this implementation is that it's meant to be used as a library as opposed to a service. So I would call Zookeeper a service because it has daemons, you go and deploy in a cluster, you connect to those services, and that's how you interact with the software. Radis, there is no concept of a daemon. It's very, very much written so that you would pull some jar, you would include it in your application, and you would be making programmatic calls to set up and use this library. So that's what I mean when I say it's a library. Um, the other novel thing about Radis is that it has a, no, a number of pluggable components. So first off, the transport itself. So how do each node that you have that is uh, participating in this distributed consensus, they can choose a custom protocol. So the couple out of the box, the gRPC is a common one, Netty is probably the other one. And then there's also bindings with Hadoop RPC, which came out of Apache Hadoop's use of um, Radis to date via the Ozone project. Uh, the state machine is the other important piece. So we'll go into that a little bit more, what a state machine is. But this is essentially how you're plugging in your own implementation into Radis. And the raft log itself has is a pluggable implementation. And that's more just evolution internal. So a Radis state machine is sort of the abstraction point that Radis gives to say, hey, okay, I'm using Radis to do distributed consensus. What is the state that I'm actually making sure is consistent? Um, so I have a little bit of pseudo code here on the right. Hopefully this is actually readable. Uh, more or less, there's two main operations that you have to implement in a state machine. The first is a query. It is essentially, think of this more like a read lock. So I have some, uh, I'm making some operation to to read the state that I have agreed upon. So I need to make sure that nobody else is modifying that state as I'm trying to read this. So two people can read the state concurrently, but I don't want anyone else to be modifying the state while I read this, right? So very much just like your normal Java read write lock paradigm. If I have someone else that's coming in to modify the state, I need to make sure that I'm getting a write lock. No one else is allowed to have a write lock. There can be no reads going out at the same time. So this is the general sort of practice that Radis gives you and what you have to implement and give to Radis so that it can do all the fun magic behind the scenes with Raft. So there's a good uh, example in Radis that does arithmetic. So how do you keep some like set of variables? And then it's you know, the cute thing about it, you can go and give it arithmetic expressions, like you could store a value for A, you could store a value for B, you can ask it, hey, please compute A plus B for me. So very simple sort of thing, but the, or the, the novelness of this is that suddenly this state isn't just stored in one place, right? The neat part is that all the state of those variables are stored across all the nodes that are participating and running this state machine. So you say, okay, well Josh, that's kind of cool. Um, I can do some state, but how does that pertain to HBase, right? So one of the things that we want to do inside of HBase is we have this uh, notion of we want to build a write-ahead log. And there's reasons why we like write-ahead logs for HBase. We need it for durability, make sure we aren't losing data. And HDFS works good in some conditions, but we also uh, could benefit from a more abstract implementation of just a log, some sort of durable um, thing that we can write to inside of HBase. So the idea would be, can we build something in Radis that is giving us a durable log? 
We don't necessarily need a full distributed file system. We don't need the things that a file system gives us. So can we build a more pure distributed log? Something like, ideally with less overhead than something like a Kafka or a bookkeeper, which would have some other set of daemons that we'd have to run, we'd have to manage, we'd have to know that they're running. You know, so can we keep a embedded, a, some sort of log service that we can embed inside of ideally HBase in the future? So can we have some primitive sort of uh, API here so we can list the logs that exist in our system? Can we create a new log? Can we delete an old log? Can we read records from that log? You know, again, your primitive append-only data structure. Can you add some stuff to the end of it? Can you read the stuff that's there? So what the architecture of this Radis log service actually looks like here is we have two sort of quorums going on here. On the left side, we have one metadata quorum, which is essentially just tracking the logs that exist in the system. So you can think of this as a hash map, something that's maintaining, here is the name of a log, and here are the nodes that are participating in actually managing the raft quorum that make up that log. So if you see here, you know, we have the, on the left, we have the transaction in yellow, which would point to, okay, I want to interact with the log called transaction, I need to talk to the three nodes that are in yellow. Um, under the hoods, this is using multi-raft, so we have multiple groups of raft actually happening at the same time across these nodes. So you see how no some of these nodes here on the right actually have multiple boxes of color around them. So we have one Java daemon that's running here, but actually participating in multiple raft groups. So there's multiple uh, groups of, so sorry to use the same word to define it, uh, multiple groups of ca uh, consensus happening at the same time in these processes. That's the notion of multi-raft here. So we don't have to have a separate daemon for every consensus group that we're running. We can actually share that inside the same JVM. One of the cool things that we have so far that we've uh, been poking around with here is some testing to actually go and use this thing now. You know, we gave you, told you about this um, very simple API. Can I actually do something that exercises this now? Um, so if you go up to the GitHub repo, there is some pretty basic instructions here now, which will build you some Docker images, spin up a Docker Compose cluster, and actually spin up that architecture that we just described. Create that metadata quorum, put some Java wrappers around them because, well, to do testing, now we can't just test the library, we actually have to write some daemons, so, oh well. But we can go create some daemons that are running here in Docker Compose, launch a shell, and actually just start interacting with it, you know, make, make a little command line tool to go and interact and create a log, write some data to it ad hoc. Um, there's also a load test tool in here which can actually go and um, create a bunch of logs, write a bunch of data to it, read a bunch of logs, make sure that the data is what we wrote it in the first time. So, kind of important. Uh, something like this actually doesn't lose data. Um, so, this is the result of me doing some basic testing using that aforementioned um, Docker Compose setup. Um, this is by no means a fancy machine. This is the little Intel NUC, like so you know your little uh, uh, four credit card size box sitting under the, my desk at home. Um, Intel i5, 16 gigs of RAM, a little baby SSD, um, Docker 18. I don't know enough about Docker to say if that's actually important or not, but just for clarity. Um, so the whole point is I wrote a bunch of scenarios, which we'll go through in a second. Each of those with ultimately targeting how long does it take me to write 50 megabytes of data. Right? So we're gonna vary things like how many logs am I writing to concurrently? What is the size of each record I'm writing to that log? How long did that take me to do it? Um, from a, our client side, there's only one client that's writing at one time, so we only have one client JVM. That client may write to multiple logs concurrently, but we still have one client process doing that at one time. All of the Java processes which are running the right side of that, that architecture. So back here, all these workers on the right, they're running with just your stock JVM options with three gigs of heap. So again, very simple. Nothing fancy going on here. So um, the general thing what you sort of see here is that the more concurrency we throw at the system, the shorter the, uh, the execution time is. So, or rather, the, the larger we have values is a better way to say it. The more values we have, the faster execution time is. So that largely makes sense with what we'd expect, right? So if we have a bunch of nodes that have to degree, 
agree upon every record we're writing to this log, and we're targeting, you know, we have to write 50 megs of data. If we write larger records, we have few things to agree upon. So in this case, the network of my little one node system is not the, the bottleneck, right? It's the actual consensus protocol for all these three um, groups of three nodes to agree, yep, this is the value that we're going to accept. So there isn't, I wouldn't dwell on this too much. This is largely just a good point of reference to say, hey, this is uh, a trivial what we can sort of expect on throughput with such a system. So, we kind of get to the point where we have to say, okay, well, you're, you're, you're describing this thing to me, you know, why do I care about this? Um, and really the big shtick here and the, the thing you have to sort of go out and on a, a limb and make an assumption is when we start moving out of on-prem installations, can we do better than just saying, I'm going to run HDFS in the cloud is really the, the, uh, the decision we have to make there. And I think the reality is we don't quite know. We think, hey, this might be, you know, running HDFS may be onerous. We know there are certain situations in which running HDFS in something where you don't have nodes running in a physical data center, there is concrete slab on the ground, there is durable power supply coming in. There are some things we know the average um, time to fill of a node in a cloud provider is gonna be significantly uh, smaller than what you're gonna get in an on-prem system. So when you lose a node that's running HDFS, suddenly now you have a crap load of data you need to go and replicate back out to these other data nodes, and that's not particularly something that HDFS does well. So the general leap of faith here is that, hey, if we can build a write-ahead log that doesn't rely on HDFS, we are going to be um, better off in terms of ops and manageability. When we lose a node, we have it's not gonna wake us up at night. We're gonna be able to sleep a little more soundly because we know that we're gonna be able to do something or use a storage solution that is not quite, uh, or uh, slightly more optimized at moving data around than what HDFS can do. When we do lose a node at the HBase level then as well, we can say, hey, the the steps you have to take to go and recover and get your HBase cluster back into a good state is a lot cleaner than, okay, we need to actually wait for all this DFS stuff to balance out, then we wanna go back and like, okay, now we need to go and restart HBase, then we, you know, the, the, the equation gets a lot more simple in short. At this point, I'll hand it over to Ankit. Hello, everyone. <coughs> um, before starting, I have some couple of questions. Uh, one question from you guys is like, how many of you are using cloud in any form or the other? Really good number. And how many are waiting for the HBase to be natively available on cloud? Only one? No, they're like a lot of people. So this is just give me an encouragement that I need to continue working on this. <laughs> okay, so let's discuss about the durability in HBase. Uh, we know like how much the durability is important in HBase. Let's say if you're booking a ticket, you got an itinerary after the successful booking, but when you go to the airport, you find out that the particular record is missing and your itinerary is no longer valid. So this kind of scenario is like kind of, you can't afford them. So, so durability in HBase is, is like as important as like uh, the other consistent or the atomicity and properties of an HBase. Uh, so let's see the pa right path in an edge base, like how the durability is ensured. Uh, so, so there is a client which is doing a port delete or increment, which is the right operation. There will be a couple of KVs which is going to the region server. So what region server is gonna do is, it's first gonna write it into the durable store called wall. And once it is successfully written to the wall, then it's gonna update the mem store of the region servers. Once everything this is done, then it's gonna return to the client that the write is successful. So why we need a wall here? So let's say if, the, if you just use the MAM store, we know like if you don't use the wall and we use the MAM store, we'll get the high throughput easily, right? Like because we are not writing into any of the disk and there is no penalty we are paying in writing into the external storage. But when, whenever the region server crashes, you lose all the memory data into the of the region server. So you need something which 
is durable, highly available, so that like if the region server crashes, it's a, can be the data in that particular wall can be replayed by another region server on another another node. So, so the characteristics we are looking for the wall is like it should be highly uh, low la uh, low latency uh, with a low latency, high throughput, and uh, highly available, durable. And the same for the store files. So, with, we want like the store files should be available in the same way like the wall. So right now we use the HDFS for both the things, like for the store files and the wall. Um, but the problem with an HDFS is like when you when you move to onto the cloud and uh, you want to deploy an edge base, uh, uh, HDFS seems to be a uh, costly operation, because costly uh, service. Because let's say if you want to remove some of the nodes, you need to decommission them so that those can be replicated on another region server, another data node. Uh, so, so what we are looking at right now is uh, is is making like getting away from the HDFS. Uh, that's that's the plan, so that we can plug any system which is available in cloud or in your local uh, data centers, and you can utilize them instead of an HDFS. So let's let's look look at look at the life cycle of the wall first. <clears throat> um, so so the wall's life cycle, if you see it, is like. It's just needed during only during the crash. So whenever the crash happens, you need to use that wall to replay the edit there in the another region server, right? Otherwise, you don't need the wall uh, for for any other use cases. But once so, the initially it was developed just for this use case. But later we realized that we can use this append-only data structure for the other services like called Zookeep uh, for the replication, uh, for the backup, and for the backup and restore. So here the use zookeeper is just tracking the walls uh, so if uh, to be replicated once those are replicated the cleaner code will get to know that now these are no longer needed for the replication and the same way it'll check for the backup thing if they are not no longer needed for the backup it'll be kind of cleaned up so this is the this was the life cycle of the uh, the wall uh, so now we're going to see like uh, uh, so so the wall is needed generally as, as I said, like in the recovery, right? So when the server crashes, uh, what are the steps the HBase follows to actually recover that particular data in the wall? So, so when the region server crashes, crashes, there are like lots of regions on that particular server. And you need to re, uh, and, when, when, and you, when you, you need to move them to another new server and whatever the data is in the wall, you need to replay that on that region servers where the regions are moved. So the first step is to identify uh, whether the uh, identify when when the region server is down, so the identification step is like you use a use zookeeper with the ephemeral nodes. Like when the ephemeral nodes is deleted, you'll get the master gets to know. But there is a problem that master can be down during the time when the region server is going down, right? So uh, there should be a way that when the master comes up, it should get to know like what are the region servers which are dead uh, at, uh, during the time he was not there. So that is done through the wall directories recognition. We, we scan all the wall directories of the region servers and see like what is reporting to us what are currently live and what are the wall directories we have which are where we don't have the region server live. So that's the first step of identification. Then the second step is fencing. Uh, so there is a possibility that uh, region server went down, means the node has been deleted because of the timeout on the zookeeper. But uh, the region server was halted because of the garbage collection. So there was a pause in the JVM itself in the region server. That's why it's not reporting any status to the zookeeper. But, uh, so, so this region server can come up after once the GC pause is completed. And it can start accepting the writes. So to fence that, what, what we do currently is like we kind of rename the wall directory. Uh, so that like and uh, renew the lease of the directory so that all the pipeline, the data data node pipeline becomes invalid, and all the writes will be failed, and the region server will go down with a fatal exception. Then the next step is like now we have fenced out the dead region server. We have identified what walls we need to actually replay them. We need to split them now. Splitting is required because currently we use a single wall per region server. Uh, so, so let's say if, uh, uh, the, regions, the regions which are getting moved are decided by the balancer. So the region one can be moved to a region server three or region two can be moved to a region server four, but the wall, there is a single wall for them. So you need to split that so that like the individual walls can be replayed on the different region servers. I'm sorry. 
Uh, then the next step occurs is the reassignment. Uh, so now the regions needs to be assigned. Now the splitting has been completed. The data for all the per, per region is, has been created. Now we need to assign those regions to the different region servers. That step involves, uh, uh, so, so the balancer decides which uh, node will get what, what region, region. And then the step occurs is the replaying. Now you need to replay the splitted walls onto the each region server. So that part is the replaying. And once the replaying is done, the region will be open and it can start accepting writes. Uh, what we are doing is, as a part of the raft refactoring is, uh, so we, we think like uh, the raft, the Apache Redis could be an option for the wall storage. It's not the only option, but we think like uh, this is the best option we have right now if we want to deploy it without any dependence on other servers. So right now we are, dip, we are refactoring an edge base code to remove a dependency of file system from wall. We are not making any change for the Redis specifically. We are just refactoring so that we can plug the other system anytime, like whoever wants to use whatever the system they like, they can use it. So, so the steps are like, uh, so in identification, we're, gonna, we're not gonna change anything. Uh, it's, it's a simple process. We're gonna identify this in the same way what we have discussed. In the fencing, uh, the, there could be a different fencing for the different uh, services we're gonna use. Like for the file system we discussed, we're gonna close the, we're gonna change, rename the directory. But for the Redis, we may need to close the, close the log so that like the no more writes can be accepted into that, uh, into that particular log. I'm just giving you an example for the Redis, but this system is not like, the refactoring does not account that thing into the system. It's just like introducing new interfaces, new uh, abstract classes so that you can implement your own implementation for the wall file system. Uh, the, in the same way, the splitting, the splitting is like earlier we were reading from the file system, creating the small, small uh, files for the regions on, on the file system. Uh, we need to provide a way in the wall provider so that like uh, you can define your own splitting mechanism because in certain scenarios, you may not need a splitting if you are storing your walls per region. The same with the reassignment, reassignment is an independent from the wall, so we don't need to change anything. Master can, change, uh, can take care of it through the balancer. Uh, in the same way, the replaying, replaying right now, it's like we, we believe that the region replaying edits are present in the region directory. And uh, we can replay it by, by just reading it to the file system. So for the, for the Redis thing, we are, we are also thinking of like reading from the raft log, create a uh, uh, re replaying edits into the corresponding region directory and through the file system where the edge files are getting stored. So, so there'll be not much changes. Uh, there'll be a change in the splitting, but in the replaying, we may not need to change. But like for the, uh, for the simplicity, for the refactoring work, we need to provide an API so that the other systems can uh, implement their own uh, way of replaying the edits. Uh, another system uh, coming into the application, as we, as we were discussing, like uh, the wall uh, time span is, uh, is expected to be short because uh, once the flush has happened, we don't no longer need the wall because we have the edge files which is in the durable storage. But because of the application, we need walls to stay longer. Uh, so why why we need a so so in the application we we make a queue of walls and we kind of re replay them each wall like each entry of the wall in a serial order per region server. But in case of Raft or Aratus, uh, uh, what we are expecting is like, uh, let's say if you have a quorum of three, three nodes which are kind of replicating the data, and you lose one node. We don't want to replicate the data of the other two nodes into the third node, like currently the data node does it, which is a costly operation. We want to uh, discard that particular quorum and call it as a read-only quorum, and uh, we, we'll, call, uh, we'll create a new quorum with the, which, where will the region server will start writing into the new log. And we'll, we'll use this read quorum in, and archive it into some storage, durable storage, so that we can read it any time for the replication. Because the replication is an asynchronous process and like the people, like the peer cluster can go away and can come up like after 10 days also. So, so that's the design decision we have taken in the Reddit, but the different design decision can be taken for the different systems available for the So why, why we are like targeting for the first implementation for the wall file system as that is because uh, there, there are other systems available which you can plug anytime, the Kafka, distributed log, Redis, HDFS, uh, Amazon Kinesis, or like the premium storage service of Azure also. Uh, but with Redis, what we believe is like, uh, it's, it's a fully embeddable system. You don't need a separate JVM to actually spawn your service. You can use this system. You just 
run the HBase, it'll come up like the draft columns will come up automatically. You don't need to deploy it in the separate service as a different service. Um, with the initial test, we believe like the we can control the latency in the raft column because we are writing one replica onto the local disk and we need a one another replica onto another node only. Uh, we can have an SSDs for the low latencies. We can control all the latencies um, on the local disk because um, it's in under control where we are deploying an edge base. <clears throat> Throughput is also uh, we believe like uh, if if you consider uh, an example like uh, uh, so. Uh, so the throughput is uh, essentially driven through like uh, how many uh, appends you can do in a in a uh, parallel fashion and do a group sync. So we are not saying like uh, the sync throughput would be better, but we are saying like with a group sync, uh, with a group commit or group sync, we can actually scale the throughput as as much we needed because uh, uh, because of the control of the writers at the raft quorum side. Uh, this particular Apache Redis implementation can help us in deploying HBase in a consistent way like you deploy it on the private cloud or it on the public cloud. Uh, there will not be any difference. Like you'll not, you don't need to rely on Apache kinases like which is coming from the Amazon service or the something coming from the uh, Google. You can have your own same deployment what you have in data center. You can deploy it on the, on the different clouds. Okay, so what what we are looking for the next? Uh, so uh, there's, there's, so Redis is a pretty new project which which has some stability uh, work needs to be done on. Like for example, the leader election sometimes can be uh, there. There could be like large number of leaders election which kind of create a congestion, and like the might, my leader might not be elected because of the the congestion. Uh, we may need to understand the Redis more. Uh, like uh, how the raft protocol is can be implemented in a different uh, in not implemented in a different way. I, I want to say like is how we can optimize the way the we we kind of replicate the data between the quorum. Uh, then the the last step is like actually plugging up this Redis log service as a pluggable component or a Redis connector in an edge base so that like anybody can just do a configuration and can use it. So the ref for the references, you, you can anyway like log into the for, for the code. You can see it on the GitHub. Uh, for the refactoring work, uh, we have a different branch. I think HBase two zero nine five two in HBase uh, GitHub. You may see the progress there, like whatever the refactoring we are doing. And you can anyways like reach us anytime with with this email ID. Questions, please. We're done. Um, are there any currently issues in RatchBase wall, or is this is just plain an enhancement so that we can run it on cloud? <laughs> there, there are no problems. So, so currently, HBase is not natively available on the cloud. So there, there are no problem with an HDFS. Uh, so you get what latency or throughput what HDFS provides with the pipeline. Uh, what we believe with the Apache Redis is like we can control the latency more better than the than the HDFS because of the the limitation on the uh, the sync and the the pipeline. You need to like to replicate all the three nodes before getting into the consensus. Like the data has been replicated. So we believe. Uh, HDFS is working fine. It's stable. It's like being there for like ten years. But Redis is like a new form for the cloud deployment as well as on the local data center as well. Okay. Thank you. Really simple question. Um, so, or is the write is still flushing the information to the disk every on the every new writes? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we, we call it, we, we don't flush it every time. I think we do it with a group coming. Okay, doesn't have to be, and it could be asynchronous. Yeah. Right. That could include, okay, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so the, a lot of the Radis API is actually written very uh, asynchronously, even when there's not necessarily a use case, but um, it works out well for HBase, because um, the way HBase does it now is that it does a group commit, so it will spin up a whole bunch of complex logic in there to buffer a bunch of writes, and then just say, okay, I'm gonna wait for all of them to finish. 
So the same sort of approach could be applied to the radis log here. Well, let's say there's a, a rack failure. The same. So yeah. So the question was, if we if we lose a rack and you lose three nodes, are we going to lose some data? And, and the reality is, yes, very much so. So that's one of those. Um, this is very much describing a, a work in progress system, and a lot of things like that you know, that we sort of take for advantage or take for granted out of HDFS, like rack awareness, things where you naturally just get HDFS places one block local, one rack local, and one rack remote. That's something that's now a concern if we would, that's, so that's a, a disadvantage we would take with a solution like this. Yeah. Uh, are we assuming that uh, region replica is enabled by default with this system? That's that is independent. Yeah, orthogonal. That, yeah. So, so only the underlying data will be stored three times, but not the, the metadata of the, of the logical regions? So currently the region replica works is like we have an internal replication which is kind of rippling the walls onto the region servers, right? Mm -hmm. So so the region replica is, is kind of a transparent from the wall system. So you're just reading the wall and rippling them onto another region servers. Yeah, but you're, so you're copying the wall also onto multiple region servers. So yeah. essentially they are the duplicate copy. Yes. Again. Yeah. So we, we thought of that thing like we could have optimized that and bring right replicas also. Right now, we, we don't have a uh, right replicas in Edgebase, but I think the customers are looking for that as well. Uh, so we believe that we can remove the duplicacy of the data. But with HDFS, you're also anyways getting the same duplicacy, right? So. Thank you, everyone. Thank we can answer guys. more questions later. <laughs>